Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Happy Easter, everybody. Come on in, find your seats. My name's Kate. I am your host for the morning, you lucky things. But what a morning to be together. Um, it's great to have you here with us, if you're here in the room, and if you're joining us online. Um, we've got a, a, a particularly special service today. Not only is it Easter, but we have four baptisms this morning. Yes, fabulous, isn't it? So we're, we're really looking forward to those. Um, we've got uh, our younger ones, Acorns and New Life Kids, they're already out at their groups. If you are part of that group and in this room, you might want to head off because they will be starting. So off you go. Um, Arise and Elevate, we're, we're pleased we've got you with us this morning. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for your amazing sacrifice and the amazing gift that you've given us in your death, but especially this morning in your resurrection and the freedom that that means for us. Lord, we pray that as we meet with you this morning, we would learn something more about just the incredible power that that brings and that you, the freedom that you bring to our lives. So be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's been quite a journey this week with Jesus, hasn't it? If we think back to last Sunday and the triumph and the celebration of Palm Sunday, through to the betrayal, the confusion of Gethsemane on Thursday evening, the brutality and just the sheer horror of Good Friday, then the silence and the grief of Holy Saturday. But today, today is Resurrection Sunday. Hope has dawned. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone and sat on it. I love that verse. <laughs> his face shone like lightning and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the woman. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. The 
garden is quiet, but with an eager anticipation. A woman stands before an open tomb, weeping with grief. Just two days ago, this woman stood before a criminal's cross, watching as her savior cried out to heaven, breathing his last. And now it's quiet, fitting that here in this pivotal moment, again, we find ourselves in a garden. The scene of the creation of mankind, crafted from the dust of the earth, all those ages ago. In that garden, God brought them to life. And in that same garden, they turned their backs on him, ushering in the curse of death. That curse passed down through the ages, every generation carrying the consequence of sin, every person who ever lived, died. And that was the end. Death was the end of every person. Every person. But one. As the woman weeps before the empty tomb, a familiar voice breaks the silence. She turns as she hears her name. There stands her risen savior, Jesus Christ. He holds out his nail-scarred hand and draws her to himself. In this garden, Jesus, the new and better Adam, made right what we made wrong. The curse of death is broken once and for all. The serpent is defeated and eternal life stands available for anyone who would receive it. On this resurrection morning, what was broken is mended. What was distant is brought near. What was dead is alive. This risen savior is the firstborn of a new creation, a new garden where we will live in perfect union with our God forever. together just to, just to know this morning that that same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead dwells in you. I don't know if you could say that to yourself this morning, but the same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead dwells in us today. Those who are followers of Jesus know the power of His resurrection. And so we're going to rejoice in God's resurrection power, in His love and His grace over our lives. I'm excited. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's sing together. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. It was a great hymn that Stuart Townend wrote. So uh, to see what a morning gloriously bright with the dawning of hope in Jerusalem. Let's sing that together. in our lives today by, by the power of your spirit within us, Lord. 
give you thanks today for your saving grace, your love for us, Lord, which took you to the cross. And Lord God, we thank you that you did not stay dead, but you rose from the grave. Lord Jesus, hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Blessed be your name. In the darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets through the virgin came the world from the throne of endless glory to the cradle
It was my cross you bore So I could live In the freedom you died for And now my life is yours And I will sing Of your goodness forevermore Worthy is your name Jesus You deserve the praise Worthy is your name Worthy is your name Jesus
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I want to just lift up hands to Jesus this morning. We lift up holy hands to you, Lord Jesus, in this place. You are worthy of all our praises, O oh God. You are worthy of all our praises, Lord. You are worthy, Lord God, of all that we can bring to you today, Lord. All of our hallelujahs, Lord. All of the depths of our hearts singing praise to your wonderful name, O oh God. Singing praises to the name of Jesus, which is the name above every other name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy speak out his name this morning. Just speak out the name of Jesus. Speak out the name of Jesus. Lord Jesus, we speak out your name. Prince of Peace, Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, righteous King, glorious Lord, Master, Savior, Jesus. We speak out your name, Jesus. Jesus, be exalted in this place, O oh God. Be exalted in our hearts, Lord. Be exalted in our lives, O oh God. Lord, that that risen power that broke through the power of death and hell, breaking the chains of sin that can so easily bind us. Lord, you set us free in your victory today. God, let your spirit come in newness of life, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You may be seated. Praise God. Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. We're going to, amen. Come on, let's applaud the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh. Hallelujah. 
We're going to read um, John chapter 20 this morning. If you turn in your Bibles there, I always think it's uh, great just to remind ourselves. And if we could read, shall we read all four Gospels this morning? Um, John chapter 20, verse 1. Come on, let's read this story together. Let's read this amazing story of Jesus rising from the dead. And such a powerful time for those of us who gathered on Friday, Friday evening, Friday morning. Just uh, helps put everything into perspective, doesn't it? And we come on this glorious resurrection morning. Amen. Hear the word of the Lord, John chapter 20, verse 1. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and she said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Just sense the despair and the brokenness in her voice. Peter and the other disciples started out for the tomb and they were both running with the, uh, and the other disciple outran Peter. He reached the tomb first. He stu- stooped and looked in and saw the linen ra- wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noted the linen wrappings lying there. While the cloth had been, that covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. And from until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that Jesus must rise from the dead. And they went home. Mary was standing outside the tomb, crying as she wept. She stooped and looked in She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying, the angels asked. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognise him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her, who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, if you've taken him away, tell me where you've put him and I will go and get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go find my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave them his message. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. And as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. And they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. And he said again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we thank you today for your word to us. We thank you today for the message of the angels that said, he is not here, he is risen. We thank you, Jesus, that death and hell could not hold you and that you rose victoriously and triumphant from the grave. And today we stand, Lord, in the privileged place of knowing the power of God in our lives. And so, Spirit of the living God, come and move upon our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The resurrection of Jesus. What an amazing, 
amazing God we, we serve. I don't know if you can imagine the, the uh, scene in life where say, maybe you've got a, a rich relative and um, they promise that they're going to give you, uh, you know, loads of money and inheritance at the end of their life. Uh, and not that you're wanting them to die or anything, but when they do pass away, you're expectant because you're expectant to receive this great inheritance. And then you go to the, uh, to the meeting where the will is being read out and they read other people's names out and they get things and you're still waiting for your name and they, they get to the end of the list and they close the book and they say, that's it. And you're thinking to yourself, oh, but I, I thought I was promised something. I thought I, I was going to get something. Sorry, your name's not there. And if you like, that's what Paul says about the resurrection. He says, if the resurrection didn't happen, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then everything is empty and vain. You may as well all just go home. <laughs> He says the resurrection of Jesus is that important, 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. The late Timothy Keller put it like this. He says, everything hangs on the resurrection. If Jesus arose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then don't worry about anything that he said. The issue on which everything hangs is not whether you like his teaching or not, but whether he rose from the dead. There's a guy called Lee Strobel. Some of you may have read his book or or watched the film, The Case for Christ. Lee Strobel was uh, an award-winning legal editor of the Chicago Tribune, and he specialised as an investigative journalist. He was a staunch atheist. And so when his wife became a Christian, Lee thought she had gone stark raving bonkers. And after doing some research into Christianity, he found that everything hangs on the resurrection. No resurrection, no Christianity. And so with all his skills as an investigative journalist, he set out to prove that Christ, that Christianity, that the resurrection was a bunch of phony baloney. He spent the next two years investigating and seeking to disprove the resurrection of Jesus. He traveled extensively and made contact with experts in their field, seeking to challenge and refute the biblical accounts. But instead of exposing the resurrection of Jesus as a lie, the more he explored, the more he found the biblical accounts to be true and reliable. After two years dedicated to his work, he gave in to the truth and to the truth that Jesus ascended from the grave, rose from the grave, and he became a Christian and a follower of Christ. The resurrection is so important. The resurrection of Jesus declares that Jesus is the Son of God. Paul put it like this in Romans. He was shown to be the Son of God when God raised him from the dead by the power of the Spirit. The resurrection of Jesus declares that we can be born again into a living hope, not into some dead religion, but into a living hope in Christ. Peter puts it like this, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's by his great mercy that we've been born again because God has raised Jesus from the dead. And now we live with great expectation. Hallelujah. There is no other way to heaven than through Christ. That's what the early apostles said on the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Then there is salvation in no other name. We can have full assurance today that we in Christ Jesus will rise from the dead. Are you glad about that? 1 Thessalonians 4 says, Since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. Sorry if I'm excited today, but I'm excited. The resurrection of Jesus declares this important truth. 
that Jesus has a continuing ministry. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is alive with us here in this place, ministering into our hearts, revealing himself to us. I want us to just take us for a few minutes back to that garden scene that we watched in the clip that we read about in John's Gospel. Despite the cosmic importance of Jesus rising from the dead, this pivotal shift in man's relationship with an eternal, immortal, and holy God, the monumental significance of Jesus rising from the dead. On this first resurrection morning, we see something of the deep nature of the love of God. Because a woman is crying. A grief-stricken woman, lost and disorientated, overtaken with heaviness, overtaken with sorrow. Even in the presence of those angels, it doesn't seem to shift her sorrow. Clouded by the tears in her eyes, a lone figure emerges in the dim light of that early morning. And she assumes that she's possibly just so disorientated that she's not thinking clearly or looking clearly. She thinks he's the gardener. Her only thought is of the body of her Lord. In this moment of cosmic importance, Jesus doesn't disappear and think, well, it's all done now. He takes the time to come and speak the name to a lonely, grief-stricken woman. And all he has to say, (coughs) Mary. I think it's really significant that Jesus did not reveal himself to Mary by telling her who he was, but by telling her who she was to him. Jesus could have stood there and said, hey, it's me, it's Jesus. But Jesus is concerned with this woman, his relationship with her and what she means to him. And so she, he speaks her name, Mary. Admittedly, we can use people's names in all sorts of ways. But when we call somebody by their name, it communicates in one word so much love, so much care. When we were in South Africa a few years ago, Susan and I met a lady who was uh, doing uh, an outreach work with uh, prostitutes in, uh, in Pretoria. And she told us a story uh, that she was... Uh, made friends with, with a lady, we'll just call this lady's name Jackie, and uh, she made friends with this young lady called Jackie who'd been on the streets since she, since she was a young child. She'd had a broken, grief, traumatic uh, family history, and she'd been on the streets in prostitution, uh, drugs, 10, 12, 15 years. And our friend was, had befriended this, this lady called Jackie, got to know her a bit. And on, on a particular occasion, she, she was able to share faith with her and she talk about Jesus. And she said to Jackie, she said, can I, can I pray for you? And so Jackie said, yes, you can pray for me. And our friend, as she, as she began to pray, she said, I, I just had a, a, well, what she thought was just a slip of a, a memory. She said, just started praying for this lady and saying, Michelle, just pray that God will restore you and bless you. Pray um, for Michelle, Lord, that, you, that she will know your voice, God, that you will bring uh, her hope and peace. Pray, Lord, that you will, you will uh, come to Michelle and that you will reveal yourself to her. And uh, this lady is just in sobs and sobs of tears. And our, our friend said that she, as she just tried to console her, 
um, Jackie said, how did you know my real name? I changed my name when I came on these streets as a young child because I never wanted to be known by that name again. And as our friend began to minister to this, to this lady, it was a turning point in her life because God knew her name and brought about restoration in her life. You know, today in this room and those of us meeting with us online, you know, so many people are longing to just somebody call their name. And not use it in a derogative way, not use it in an abusive way, but to express our love for another individual by using their name. I don't know where, where everyone's at this morning, but I just want to I wonder whether we could uh, let's, let's just do this. If you're not sitting next to somebody, maybe you could just sit next to somebody just for a minute. Could you just move? Great. If um, some of you don't know the name of the person next to you, in a minute I just want you to ask their name. And then, in a minute... I want you to, I don't want you to say a huge sentence. I want you just to speak the person's name to them in love and appreciation. Just say their name. Turn to the person next to you. Some of you have got very long names. <laughs> when we speak a person's when we speak a person's name when we speak a person's name we can communicate healing Forgiveness. We could communicate love and acceptance and value when we speak a person's name. You can do um, a little Bible exercise if you like. I've, I've, start, I've started you off. This is a start for 10. Just just really interesting when God calls people by name. In Genesis 3, God says, Adam. Adam is hiding. He sinned against God and he knows it. He knows that something has gone wrong. And it's not that God doesn't know. God's not on an information trek. He knows what's happened. And yet he still speaks his name. Because God calls out to sinners. In Genesis 16, Hagar is running from a destitute situation. She's lonely, she's an outcast. God calls her by name because he reaches out to the outcasts. He calls her by name and he promises to keep her and to prosper her. And she replies, what a beautiful reply, you are the God that sees me. In Genesis 22, Abraham 
God calls out his name because he sees the faithfulness of Abraham. God speaks and directs the path of the faithful. In Genesis chapter 46, Jacob feels completely lost. So much has gone wrong in his life. And yet God calls out his name, Jacob, and he reaffirms his promise to him as the God who does not forsake his promises. In Exodus 3, Moses is, feels as though his life is not worth anything, as though he's never going to achieve anything. He's got a second-rate job in a place that he didn't choose because he's running away. God calls his name from a burning bush and says, I've got plans for you. I've got purpose for you. God speaks out his name. Samuel, a young boy with very little experience of life, maybe felt of no value to anybody, maybe just thought this is what my life is going to be, but God turns up in a dream in a night and speaks out his name to a young lad. Can I say today that God exalts the young. God lifts up the young. He loves the children. You see, God always speaking out to look out for the orphans. Look out for the children who haven't got parents. Look out for them. God's heart is for them. God's heart is for this little lad and speaks and exalts him to the place of a prophet. Zacchaeus, somebody who's hated and despised by his own family and countrymen because of the career path that he's chosen. In the sense, that he's actually forsaken God by, by choosing this path. That's how his, his uh, peers would see it. But he hears some sin of Jesus and has to try and look. And Jesus walks out of his way in order to call Zacchaeus by name. Because, Zac because Jesus, God, lifts up those that are lost. Simon Peter, in those last closing chapters of the gospel, Jesus says to Simon, Simon, Satan has desire to sift you like wheat. In other words, Jesus, is, Jesus knows the, the difficulties and the, the problems and the situations that Simon's going to face. And Jesus says, I'm praying for you. I can't think of anybody else who I'd rather have pray for me. Because God stands with his children. This morning, God calls your name. The resurrected Jesus is not whisked off into heaven, just job, job done. No, he, he comes and he speaks your name. Because he loves every individual, every soul. God fully knows who you are. He knows all of your sin, all of your mistakes, all of your past, all of your failures. And he still calls you. By name. Isaiah put it like this Now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you, do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. For each of us today, I believe we should put ourselves in that resurrection story. Identify with Mary and the confusion of her life and just that sense of somebody being completely disorientated with life. 
and we should hear the voice of Jesus calling our name. Mary's response, and when we hear God call our name, we do need to respond. She calls him Rabboni, teacher, master, Lord, basically the one I want to follow. The one I put my trust in. Today we've got four people who are going to be baptised. And baptism is that action in our lives where we affirm and we proclaim that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Saviour. For those of us who have been baptised, and I guess it's probably most of us in the room, this morning is that reminder of that commitment that I made to follow Jesus all those years ago. It acts as that reminder to reaffirm God's saving grace that has rebirthed us into Christ and filled us with the power of his spirit. This morning, maybe baptism is new to you. Maybe you've got questions about God about Jesus, about his resurrection, like those people I referred to earlier. But whatever questions and thoughts you may have today, I trust that each and every one of us will take steps to know this Jesus who calls you by name. There's some Why Jesus booklets in the, in the foyer, and if, if you don't know the story of Jesus and what Jesus Um, has done for you in dying for your sin, then please take one of those books today. Pick one of those up on, on the way out. And if today you've invited Jesus into your life, but you've never been baptized, then there's some little leaflets in the carousel called baptism. And I'd love you to pick one of those up on your way out and just say, actually, this, this baptism thing, I need to, I need to think about this. Because baptism is the active sign of our obedience and faith and our commitment to follow Jesus. It's that declaration and identification with Christ's death and resurrection. To die to ourselves and live to newness of life. Baptism is that which confirms us and ratifies our relationship with Christ Jesus. I, I, love bapt- <laughs> I love baptism services. I, I remember, I can even now just see myself standing in that uh, very similar baptistry when I was an 11-year-old boy uh, with my hands folded. And I just had one person behind me because I, I was very light. And it's, uh, that's, no, no, so I wasn't saying anything, Mark. Uh, <laughs> I I can remember going under the water and coming out wet. (laughs) But what that symbolises is that every part of me wants to die to my old life and wants to be fully wet to the newness of life that Christ offers. Mary, 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 I pray today that each and every one of us will hear the voice of the resurrected Jesus calling us by name. He died, yes, for the sins of the world, yes, to free the world from sin, but he died for you. He shed his blood for you, and he calls you by name. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you this day that you have made a way 
for us to be reconciled to our Heavenly Father and for us to know peace and hope and love and acceptance and value and favour. Your love for us, Lord God, because of Jesus, his sacrificial death and his power that raised him from the grave. So God, we thank you today that Jesus is alive. And Lord, in this room this morning, I pray, Heavenly Father, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you will speak into every life. Call each individual by name. That we would respond to you, our teacher, our Lord, our Savior, our friend. In Jesus' name, amen. Our, uh, our children are come going to come back in shortly and join us so that they can be here as Niall, Naomi, Mark and Io respond to that personal call from Jesus to believe and to be baptised because we don't want them to miss that. Um, but first, let's have a little bit of a look at what's coming up over um, the next week or so. Um, firstly, a really big thank you to everybody who's been involved this weekend in the Teze service on Thursday, um, in the Church's Together Walk of Witness Friday morning, and, and our Good Friday service here in the evening. Um, we couldn't do it without you all, so massive thank you to everybody involved. Next Saturday, um, we have got our senior citizens' Easter tea. It's, if you're booked in, it's 2 for 2.30. If you're helping, it's slightly earlier. Um, so if you're bringing cakes, please do bring those. If you're picking people up, please do remember to go and get them and take them home again. That would be really great. Um, this coming Tuesday, um, we've got our prayer day. Hiya. Um, we've got prayer full on Tuesday in the morning. If you're around at nine o'clock, that is in the prayer room. Otherwise, half past seven here in the evening. The theme for the evening is Thanksgiving, which just seems completely appropriate. Easter week, doesn't it? Um, uh, last but not least, excited. Um, Mark spoke a couple of weeks ago um, about and just asking us to pray for the eldership and the leadership team. Um, and there was an email that went out after that, just asking for a bit of feedback. If you haven't replied already, if you could do that by the end of tomorrow, that would really help them out. Um, if you didn't get the email or you would like a paper copy of what that email said, speak to Phil and Wendy, who are going to wave, please. There you go, speak to Phil and Wendy over there, and they will give you the details about that. If you would like to give a talk, we've come to that part of the service where we, we think about our tithes and our offerings. Um, if you'd like to give us some details up on screen about how you can do that, you can um, pop to the, the website, you can do it through Church Suite, you can scan the QR code. Um, if, if you'd like to give in person today, there is a box at the back that you could just drop something into. Um, but let's just, just pray over those and pray as, as we gather back together again. Lord, we want to thank you once again for your most incredible gift that you gave us. And out of what you give to us, we want to give back to you. So Lord, we just ask that you will take our tithes, our offerings, that you'd bless them and that you would use them as you want them to be used. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's uh, stand together and we're going to sing just as our children come in and uh, as we get ourselves ready. Praise the Lord. Happy day. <laughs>
kids just keep an eye on the children that'd be great let's keep it to four this morning <laughs> right thanks chris Whoop. so i think it would be good to um have a uh, Nyla Naomi and Mark and Io, come and stand up here with me. That would be great. Let's give them a round of applause. Mark. Come on, guys, come and stand up here. Brilliant. So as we were just saying a moment ago, uh, uh, baptism is a, a public act and a declaration of our faith, uh, committing our life to follow in Jesus, dying to our old life. As we go in those waters this morning, it's symbolizing, as Paul says, that dying uh, to life. And as we raise out of the water, we won't leave you in there for three days, don't worry. Uh, when we rise out of the water, it symbolizes walking in newness of life, receiving God's grace. This is a, this is a, a, a faith-filled action today. Just as we come and we take communion, we take the bread and the wine, it's an action which Jesus has commanded us to do. And by doing it, we respond to his, his command by faith. And so as we do this today, responding to Jesus' command, and as, as Peter says in his sermon on Acts uh, chapter 2, he says, each of you, repent of your sins and be baptised. Turn to God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And so baptism is that decision which follows repentance and confession of faith. And we publicly declare our, conf our, our confession of faith in Christ Jesus. So these guys are going to share their testimony this morning. They're going to share what Jesus has done in their life, the change that he was, has wrought, and um, how that they want to get baptized this morning. So I'm going to maybe start over. Who wants to start? <laughs> Niall. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right, shall we draw straws? <laughs> okay. Right, I'm Naomi, as I think most of you know. Um, I've known God all my life. My dad was a vicar, and I knew God was there from when I was small. I grew up going to church. I don't remember when I asked him into my life. He's just always been there. As I got older, I made many commitments and recommitments as I strayed off the path. I realised I couldn't do life without him. As a teenager, I was confirmed, and for a long time I thought this was enough, that it was enough of a commitment. But this last year, and probably a bit before, I felt him prodding me, making me question my decision. This year has been a tough year, but without Jesus, God in my life, I've never got through. When I felt low, He's placed people in my path to pick me up. In my job, about this time every year, I know if I have, I'll never know if I have hours or even a job, but every year God has provided for me. Amen. And every year it's been better than I could have hoped. Yeah. He's always been there and carried me through situations. 
God has never let me down or fall. So I am being obedient to him and I'm giving myself totally to him as he, t- as he did for me on that cross. He took all my sin, pain, sorrow, so I could be free. So Jesus, I thank you. Thank you for being there when life was hard. Thank you for carrying me and walking with me and always being there. So I'm Niall, um, <clears throat> I'm married to Naomi, if you've not noticed. Um, so I first encountered Jesus um, without knowing, really. Uh, I was going to a beach mission in Bridlington where we used to live. Um, <laughs> in truth, I was waiting for the vicar to get on with his talk, because I just wanted to get back to the football and the cricket. Um, <laughs> I didn't realise at the time, but some of the stuff that was being said has, has stuck, and it's kind of reappeared as, as I've gone along, so I'll never forget that moment. Um, I then started to go out with Naomi at school when we were a lot younger, and um, <laughs> I was drawn into finding more out about God uh, and making a commitment before we got married. I, I should say that wasn't a, a condition, we were allowed to get married, but I, I made that commitment first. I spent years thinking that infant baptism was sufficient, uh, and, and days would come, baptisms would come, and I'd be like, no, I'm okay, I've, I've been there and done that. Um, kind of swimming along, doing the comfortable Christian thing uh, on the surface, but probably being a little bit superficial, if I'm being totally honest. Uh, In hindsight, God's been nudging me for a long time, uh, and I've been a bit of a stubborn northerner and sort of not really taken on. Um, Then about 18 months ago, our world got turned upside down. I think this would go nudging a bit harder. As a family, we went through some tough stuff, but throughout it, it was clear that God wanted what's best for us. I went through Freedom in Christ online on my own, with all my friends there, Um, and baptism really struck me hard between the eyes. God was being really blatant now. Uh, We then went on to do Freedom in Christ together um, with with real people this time, and and again, it just re-emphasised that I needed to make this extra commitment. Um, Throughout this tough time, we felt God's presence strongly, and not only has God provided directly but he's provided people to support us Um, people that don't crave the limelight we never see them around and about they just do things in the background people that are here this morning and we just want to say thank you to you guys it means such a a great deal to us Um, and we just we just know that you're filled with God's love and that's made such a difference to us as a family so thank you Um, we're still a work in progress I'm still a work in progress but things are unrecognizable from about a year ago Um, and I see baptism as another step on that process. I'm so grateful for all God has done directly and through the support of our family and friends. So thank you and thank God. Hiya, my name's Mark, as you you may already know. Um, There's nothing special about my journey, there's nothing special about me. But there's a few truths in here, and uh, this is my journey, how I got here. As with many people, I went to Sunday school, and as I grew up, the only thing I really knew about Jesus was the films I saw at Easter, The Robe and the Ten Commandments. Um, and it's uh, only recently that I've learned the, uh, uh, what Easter represents uh, at the ripe old age of nearly 62. As a teenager and young man, whenever I got up to no good, um, I would always say, please, God, let me, get with, let me get away with that. I won't do it again until the next time. So I guess I sort of believed, but really, really didn't know. In, in my 30s, life was just full of alcohol, social drugs, women, and as much uh, trouble as I could get myself into, really. Uh, I used to have fun working in the nightclubs, and uh, I ran a few doors, etc. Um, then this went on till I was 40 years old, and... Suddenly, uh, my little prayer to God, which I, which I always used to say, just didn't work, and um, I didn't get away with something, and this calmed me down for a few years. In my mid-40s, I fell back into my old ways, and I believe I was worse than before. Uh, then, when I was about 50, I woke up one morning thinking I needed to go to church, and I just had this voice saying to me, I, I need to go to church. Um, 
and that stayed with me ever since, you know, right to this day. Um, I moved from relationship to relationship, never really liking what I saw in the mirror, and never felt any peace inside me. I felt I just needed to put myself in places where I could encounter conflict or confrontation. Uh, then one day I just said out loud, and I never planned to say it, um, but it just came out, please God, can you find me a partner who is churchy? Using my word. Um, I, carried, I carried on doing what I'd always done until then. Uh, then I retired from rugby at 54, and I just stopped drinking, stopped doing everything, and removed myself, um, everything associated with that life. I don't know why I did that, I just did. Um, the only time I ever really went to church was with my mum to the Christmas Mass at our local church in Stamford, when we could. Um, also, the usual weddings, christenings, and funerals. Um, but in my 50s, I, f I found myself trying to pluck up courage to go to church on my own, but never managed it. And a couple of years later, Jennifer came along, and I couldn't believe my look. This intelligent, beautiful, kind and caring woman was a Christian as well. It seemed like I got all my um, Christmases at once, really. Um, Jennifer never really spoke about being a Christian until one day when I asked her if she would take me to church. I think I've always been a reluctant believer because I did not have time for it because I was busy enjoying myself. However, now I realise that God has always been in my life, just gently guiding me or nudging me along my path, sort of looking out for me. Well, that's, that's how it felt to me anyway. It still does. Um, I think he brought Jennifer and I together and he has now given me everything I need to follow a new path and a new life as a Christian and to go on a voyage of discovery or awakening. Over the last five years, um, I've had two full knee replacements and a hip replacement, and I know God was with me through these operations. With my right knee, I got an infection while I was in hospital and I was there for three weeks. And I, th I think this was about the last time I said, please God, let me get away with this. Because... <laughs> Because the truth of it was, I could have lost, could have lost my leg. Um, we, we started to come to New Life Church when we moved to Sleaford in November 21. And I joined a connect group where for the first time I mixed with people who I saw had a relationship with God and were serious about it. I'd like to say thank you to everyone at my connect group and especially Andy and Lorna for helping me along my journey. And of course Jennifer. Um, I, I attended a couple of courses with Jennifer at the church, which were a bit too much for me at the time, but I slowly started to discover what is now my new faith in God. I saw all the people at church and how friendly and happy they seemed to be at church, and I wanted to have that love for God and happiness as well, and be part of the family. I said the sinner's prayer with Jennifer about September, October time last year, I think, but the next day, and I don't know why, I walked around all day saying to myself, God is good. And I must have heard that somewhere. It was probably in here. <laughs> the next couple of days, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Lorna and Alex both said to me that I looked different. I couldn't believe it. Surely they didn't know I'd said the sinner's prayer. <sighs> well, I did have a little cry with Alex. Don't tell anybody about that, please. <laughs> Since then, I found it easier. I do try to believe with childlike faith, but sometimes my old self comes back and starts challenging what I'm learning. I talk to Jennifer about it, and it brings me back in line. And I do still struggle when reading the Bible to really understand what it is saying. I do firmly accept my newly realised faith in Jesus Christ, and I think because of this, I feel I'm at peace with myself inside now. And I just have this feeling of warmth, and maybe I like myself a little bit now, instead of hating what I saw in the mirror. Every day at some time, maybe several times a day, I say, please, dear God, fill me with the Holy Spirit and to help me be a better man every day and help me understand what I read in the Bible. I don't need a sign from him because I know he's with me and always has been with me. I believe that baptism is my next step on my journey to, bring a true, to become a true disciple of God and this confirms my faith and commitment to him and being a Christian. Hopefully I never have to say, please, God, let me get away with it again. Thank you. Good morning, church. My name is Ayolua, which means joy of the Lord. And I'm rededicating my life. I rededicated my life to Christ a few months ago. I don't really have a specific salvation story, 
It feels like God has been working on this lost sheep to, for years to bring her home. I'd been returning home all for all the wrong reasons over the last four years. I just wanted to escape hell and only loved what God for what he could do for me, not for who he is. But now I know that he is marvelous, merciful, loving, and is love, gracious, just, forgiving, and the most perfect dad to me. Since I've given my life to Christ, he has been doing wonders in my life. One of them was healing me from a five year long disease I had. The disease became so bad that I couldn't sleep on the left side of my head anymore. I couldn't wear my glasses, but I can do now. <laughs> do certain hairstyles and many more things, unless I wanted to deal with the pain. In 2022 and 2023, it started affecting more areas of my body and became more painful. The doctors didn't know what to do, especially because it seemed like another non-serious disease. I didn't see any good future ahead of me, or if I even had one because of the disease. But God, God had other plans, plans not to harm me, <laughs> but plans to give me a hope and a future. A few days after I gave my life to Christ, I decided to take a step out in faith to sleep on my left side of my head. Glory be to God, because I've been able to sleep on the left side of my head from that day on. What I thought was impossible, God made possible. He freed me from the physical and mental hold the disease had on me. Thank you, Jesus. My mom has been praying that I should have a, a personal relationship with God before I go to university. I thank God for answering her prayer, and I thank her for not giving up on me, even though it took years. I hope my story can encourage, and can encourage others who are praying for their loved ones that God isn't done yet. His will is not to harm you. He can do it. His timing is perfect, and he hasn't forgotten you or your prayers. There's still hope. Continue praising, continue praying, and continue trusting in the Lord with all your heart. He will not desert you. Aside from the service at church being a game changer in how I perceived God and having a relationship with him, Stathen, last year October, played an important role too. I can't remember which evening it was, but one of the youth workers told her story and it hit way too close to home. After everyone had left, I stayed to just, just to wait for a friend, but ended up talking with that youth worker and I broke down crying. It was like a relief. There was still hope. My life could still change. I'm grateful for everyone that God used to make Statham happen. You are all absolute blessings, and I thank God for putting you in my life. When I decided to begin a fast for a deliverance of the sin, I was afraid of what attacks the devil had in store for me. As I was reaching the end of my thoughts, it kind of sounded like my voice in my mind just started to become quiet towards the end. And then a voice, which I firmly believe was God's, intercepted my thoughts and told me to be strong and courageous. I was in shock. God's voice sounded familiar and was as clear as day and so authoritative. I couldn't even tell whether it sounded like my voice or not. I just remember being stunned because for the first time since giving my life to Christ, I 100% knew and instantly recognized that it was God speaking to me. All the verses that keep me going are Psalm 56, verse 3, Psalm 23, verse 4, Romans 6, Romans 8, 1, in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. But most importantly, in the weeks leading up to this glorious day, Acts 8, 36 to 37 has been encouraging to me. It's about Philip and the eunuch from Ethiopia. Reading that story encouraged me that I'm ready to be baptized. I thank God because by his grace, I have been saved through faith, now and forevermore. I thank God that I was born into a Christian family where my faith has been introduced to me from day one. I have examples of how I can have a Christian relationship with God all around me. I've learned and have been able to memorize a lot of Bible verses that help me overcome difficult times by the grace of God. And I can openly have a relationship with God at home. I thank the church, especially all the youth workers, Paul, Hattie, Liv, Ian, Mandy, Anne, Susie, and Nick who have mentored me and taught me more about Jesus during Elevate and have shaped who I, helped shape who I am today. I thank God for my friends in church, Erin and especially Hannah, who have encouraged me. 
Lastly, I want to say farewell to my old life. I won't miss it. <laughs> it is dead now, and I have been made new by the grace of God. I, Ayolua Shomade, hereby publicly declare that Jesus is my savior and I have faith in him. I am willing to die to my sins and resurrect with him. Hereby, I surrender my soul unto Jesus in front of my family, the church today, and forever in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Wow. Well done, guys. That was really great. And I uh, trust church that we just take some encouragement and comfort from those uh, wonderful words. What an amazing, amazing testimonies. I'm going to uh, read a baptism promise for each of you and been praying for you over the last couple of days. And uh, then I'll just give opportunity if there's anybody who's got a word who wants to share. Maybe you could uh, make your way to the front and uh, just uh, bring some encouragement in that way. That would be great. Mark. Uh, your baptism promise is 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And as I was praying for you, Mark, and, and that verse, I really felt that God has new for you. And uh, you talked a little bit about the old, but I just want to reaffirm that. The old is gone, and um, God says, Behold, I'm doing a new thing in your life and that he encourages you to walk in the newness of, of life that he has for you. Niall, your scriptural promise, these will be written down, you don't need to remember. Isaiah 54 verse 10, For the mountains may move and the hills disappear, but even then my faithful love for you will remain. My covenant of blessing will never be broken, says the Lord who has mercy on you. And God reaffirms his love for you today. He receives you. He is for you. He accepts you. You are of great value to him. Naomi, Romans 15 verse 13 says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. God is giving you a new confidence, a new courage, a new boldness. This baptism today is the start of a new dimension of relationship with God in the power of his spirit. I owe Psalm 32 verse 8. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and I will watch over you. You're not allowed to go to university, by the way. <laughs> but just with you saying those words, I, just, I really feel that's so poignant for you. God says, I will guide you. I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you. And I will watch over you. I will watch over you. And that's what I was praying for you. And I know we had a lot of conversation on the phone. And, and I... I said these words to you and I say them again, ask, seek, knock, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. For when you ask, God answers. When you seek, you'll find. When you knock, the door will be open to you. Bless you. Mark, it's so good to see you here. And uh, just a couple of verses or a passage for you, but I'll just have the, the quote from the passage. The first verse, and you said it earlier, actually. The Lord says, I have carried you since you were born. I carried you before you were born. I will be your God throughout your lifetime until your hair is white with age. I made you. I'll look after you. I will carry you along and I will save you. And then, when Nathanael was first bought, brought to Jesus, an interesting little conversation happened, but Jesus saw him coming, and he said, here is a true Israelite, a true man, a true follower of mine, in whom there is nothing false. I want you to hang on to those words. 
Bless you. And then for Niall. Niall, forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it's springing up. Don't you see it? And then he has sent me to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair, and they will be called oaks of righteousness, planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Bless you. Naomi, I have a promise and a reminder. The promise is in Isaiah, which says, He will be the sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. And the reminder... is the verse in Ephesians that says, you are his workmanship. And that word workmanship means a poem or a masterpiece or a grand design. So you, Naomi, are God's workmanship, designed specially for the, jo the things that he has in store for you, the things he has planned for you. Hi, oh, hello. <laughs> um, we speak often, don't we, about questions. Um, uh, I've, I've always been somebody that's had questions, and I think you're, you're very similar. Um, and we both know that I don't have all the answers, <laughs> and um, Mark doesn't have the answers. We don't have every single answer, do we? Um, but there is one answer that we do know, um, and that is that um, it is through Christ that we are saved. And... It is through faith that we are saved, and it is through faith that we have sight. And that sight is on Jesus, yeah, who is the only answer we need. So I've just got um, something from Hebrews 11. So Hebrews 11, 1 says, Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of the things we cannot see. And then in verse 6 later on it says, And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Praise God. Well, can we pray for these guys? Can you stretch out your hands? We're going to pray for them as they get baptised. Father, we lift before you Mark and Nyla, and Naomi and Io. Lord, we pray now that as they take these steps of baptism... Um, Lord God, that you will, um, Lord, fill them with your power and your spirit, Lord. As they go through the waters of baptism, Lord, may they indeed die to their old life and be raised to newness of life. Lord, set the seal of the power of your spirit upon them, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. I just felt that God was saying, you don't have to go through trials just to feel God's presence in your life. But God has got a life ahead of you that you're going to feel his power. You will walk in his steps and you'll know the power of God in your life. You won't have to look for the bad times to receive it, but he will be with you every minute of every day and you shall know his power in your life and he will put his arms around you and strengthen you and he will sustain you in every path you go through.
Praise God. Well done. Thank you, Jesus. I'd love us just to uh, pray one more time for these guys uh, as we close. I, if you want to come down here, if you, if you like, just don't worry about being wet. Just come stand over there. That's it. Great. Can we pray again? Let's reach our hands towards these guys. Father, we want to thank you for for Mark and Niall and Naomi and Io, Lord, and we bless them now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, God, that you will fill them with the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would lead them into righteousness and into joy, that you would lead them into newness of life. Mark, Niall and Naomi and Io, we bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus. We bless you with the favour of God. May the love of God fill you. May the truth of God leave you. And may the life of God bubble up in you day after day after day in newness of life. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Great. Thank you so much, guys, for being patient with us today. It's been a great day together. Uh, Teas and coffees will be served at the back. And as as I said earlier, if you want to know more about Jesus, then do pick up one of these little booklets, Why Jesus, or come and speak to me after the service. And there are also some baptism leaflets in the carousel uh, to know more about baptism. The Lord bless you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace. And go in the name of Jesus. Amen. Have a great week.